Okay, well, it's good to be with you again this evening. And just have really enjoyed the uh, opportunity to be able to uh, worship with all of you and uh, be able to fellowship with some of you and just have had a great time. And we've come here now to our uh, fifth and concluding session dealing with the issue of has the church replaced Israel? And again, I'd just like to express my gratitude to you and the church and Pastor Caldwell and the leadership. Uh, it's just been a tremendous weekend and I'm sad it's coming to an end, but uh, looking forward to ha- traveling back to California. Again, thanks for the, for the prayers and the mention for the safe travel and those things. And So anyway, what we're going to do uh, right now is uh, finish this up with some things I wanted to talk about. But before we get specifically into the message, I just wanted to let you know that the, uh, the things that I have put up on the screen, the PowerPoints and the, uh, the Word document in, in regard to the 12 reasons why replacement theology is not a biblical doctrine, they're, they're up on my uh, website at mikevlock.com. Uh, some of you have asked if you could get access to those. So that is, if you just go to mikevlock.com, it's on the front page, it's near the top. I think you may have to click on it and then click one other thing, but that's easy to find, but that's, that's available for you. Okay, so as we bring things to a close, I, I wanted to make some uh, comments in regard to the role of, of the church uh, in the Bible. You know, we've, we've done a lot of talk about Israel, and you know, one of the reasons why that is because there are some who are saying that there's no uh, significance to Israel as a nation uh, in the future, and that that role has been superseded or fulfilled by the church or replaced by the church. So we've obviously spent a lot of, pa- a lot of time on passages showing that that's not the case. Um, I did want to make some statements in regard to where the church fits into the purposes of God. And and in doing that, uh, on this first slide that I have here, um, I don't believe that the church existed in the Old Testament. I think it's it's a new covenant entity linked with the the pouring out of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Uh, but it is important to understand that nations, I'm talking about the nations here, I mean, I'm you know, particularly talking about those that would be outside of Israel. Um, the nations have been important uh, in God's plans. Uh, the Genesis 10 to 11 actually mentions the nations and where they spread out throughout the earth. And I think part of the reason why they're mentioned in Genesis uh, chapters 10 and 11 is because it's emphasizing that God cares about them and that he's quickly going to have a salvation plan that begins in Genesis 12 with uh, Abraham and the Abrahamic covenant, whereby there's going to be a plan for Israel to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And so on the second point on this sheet, you know, I, I reference uh, verses that I've made many references to this weekend, Genesis 12, 2 to 3, and Genesis 22, 18, where Abraham and the nation that, that is to come from him is meant to be a blessing to the nations and the families of the earth. So even in the Old Testament, it was predicted Gentiles, nations would be blessed it's going to end up taking the Messiah and the work that he does uh, in order to bring unity between Jews and Gentiles and for those who have been excluded from the promises and the covenants to be brought near them. So that needs to take place in time with the coming of Jesus. But those predictions were there in the Old Testament. In addition to the beginning of the Abrahamic covenant, the prophets predicted that Israel's Messiah would bring blessings to the Gentiles. And again, these are all of, the, of these passages that I put up here, Isaiah 49, Amos 9, Isaiah 19, those are also passages that we've covered throughout the course uh, of the conference. So not only is that promise there in the original Abrahamic covenant, but, but the, uh, the prophets of, of Israel uh, later on after Genesis 12 reaffirm that truth. The Isaiah 49 passage in particular emphasizes that it's going to end up being the ultimate servant of Israel who we now know as Jesus, as Jesus the Messiah, who according to verses 3 through 6, is going to restore Jacob, he's going to restore Israel, and he's going to be a light of salvation to the Gentiles. It's important to understand also that Jesus came uh, to the people of Israel, but he also came to save Gentiles too. Uh, we looked at a passage before, you know, Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 to 7, where you know, uh, Jesus told the disciples that they were to go uh, not, not to uh, the Gentiles or the Samaritans at that point, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, proclaim, proclaiming the nearness of the kingdom. So there was a particular time where the message was focused on going to Israel, but it's also true uh, that Jesus came to save Gentiles, and that's very clear from several texts. As a matter of fact, one, one of the first indicators that things uh, were not going well as far as the reception from the people of Israel but that there were Gentiles who were starting to believe is Matthew 8.11. Let 
Matthew 8.11 is one of the first indicators of that. And in Matthew uh, chapter 8, verse 11, you know, Jesus has this you know, encounter, and uh, he's dealing uh, uh, with a Gentile who has shown faith. And he says in Matthew 8.11, I say to you that many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom... In other words, some within Israel who should have known better and had access to the covenant promises, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he's indicating that some will be blessed. And when he talks about that, well, many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Israel's patriarchs. That's an indication that the gospel and salvation is going to the world. Uh, Another passage that I'd like to look at would be, I actually don't have it mentioned on here, but I wanted to turn to Romans chapter 15. Uh, in Romans chapter 15, uh, verses 8 and 9, um, I find this particularly significant because this indicates the both and, that Christ, it tells you, Paul's actually telling you the purpose why Christ has come. And he says in math, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 15, verse 8, for I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision, and the circumcision would be Israel, on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers. So that's interesting. That's one of the things that Jesus does. He's a servant to the circumcision. He's a servant to the Jewish people. He comes to confirm the promises given to the fathers. And so that indicates that he is planning on fulfilling his promises and purposes with Israel. But notice in verse 9, it al he also says, And for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy at his written, as it is written. And then there's a cluster of Old Testament citations backing that up, that it was God's plan and it's Jesus' plan to not only confirm the promises to the nation Israel, but also to bring blessings to the Gentiles. So it ends up being a both and. The next point on the screen here that I would want to mention on this bottom one here is that Jesus predicted that he would build his church. And so in Matthew uh, chapter 16, now this is pretty far along into Jesus' ministry. Uh, most of his ministry up until this point has been the proclamation of the nearness of the kingdom to the cities and the leaders of Israel. And that has not gone well. We, we mentioned before that in Matthew 11, the cities of Israel were not believing. In Matthew chapter 12, the religious leaders committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit by saying that Jesus was doing his power, um, uh, that he was doing his miracles in the power of Satan. But when you come to Matthew 16, 18, this is the first reference to the church uh, in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, there's only uh, two references to the church uh, in the gospel, both of them being in Matthew, uh, in Matthew 1 in chapter 16 and, and, and another in a cl in, clustered in a verse in Matthew chapter 18. But verse 18, uh, Jesus says that I say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So what's important about there is Jesus is, is telling us for the first time that he is going to build his church. I take it that the church at this point has not been around. It is something that he is going to build um, we don't have time to turn there, but if you were to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, uh, Paul indicates there in that particular verse that it ends up being the New Testament apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus being the cornerstone that is the foundation for the church. So we believe that the church is a New Testament enemy, ent entity, and it is here that Jesus first predicts it. From Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 to 20, we get what's, you know, what we refer to as the Great Commission. Uh, back in Matthew 10, the disciples were only to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but now with Christ atoning death, where he gives his life as a ransom for many, which is stated in Mark chapter 10, I think around verse 45, uh, the statement that Jesus made that he came to give his life as a ransom for many is probably a reference back to Isaiah 52, 15, where it indicates that the uh, the suffering servant was going to sprinkle many nations. But in Matthew 28, we're told the very last two verses of, of really of this gospel, 
verse 19, Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So notice here, verse 19, they're to go and make disciples of all the nations. Something has changed, atonement has been made for sin, and now the gospel is to be taken to the world. So we do believe that the church was born on the day of Pentecost uh, in Acts chapter 2. On that day, uh, the Spirit was poured out uh, in fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, and therefore uh, the church began on that day. And so when it comes to a definition of the church, this is something that I mentioned earlier, and my my understanding of the definition of the church from what I think Scripture is saying is that the church is the new covenant community of believing Jews and Gentiles in this age between the two comings of Jesus, the Messiah. Obviously, ever since the time of Exodus chapter 20, Israel had been under the Mosaic law. We read in Ephesians 2 that Jesus has uh, removed the barrier and with his death um, has inaugurated a new covenant. As a matter of fact, in Luke's gospel at the Lord's Supper, Jesus says, this is the new covenant in my blood. So when Jesus died, that was the establishment of the new covenant. And one of the key blessings of the new covenant, according to Ezekiel chapter 36, is the indwelling Holy Spirit. And one of the things that we see on Acts chapter 2 is what? That when the Spirit is poured out, there's an indwelling among the believers at that particular time. So Gentiles become, with the church, God's people alongside believing Jews. And there are several passages that teach this, Ephesians chapter 2 and 3, Acts chapter 15, Galatians chapter 3. Uh, I may want to make some observations here if you turn to e- Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, this is a great passage which is talking about unity in the people of God, but even as there's unity, there's still a distinction as far as ethnicity in regard to uh, uh, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, but in Ephesians chapter 2... Uh, verse 11, you know, we see that the Gentiles, in, in verse 11 we're told, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles, in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the circumcision, should be the Jews, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time, and this is before the, you know, what Christ had done on the cross, that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So before Christ does what he does at the cross, the Gentiles do not have hope. There's the promise in the Old Testament that they would be included in the people of God someday, but before the cross of Christ, that's not a reality. So he says in verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, reference to the Mosaic law, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. And so when you jump down to... uh, Verse 18, we're told that for through him, we have our access in one spirit to the Father. Again, another new covenant reality there. And verse 19, we're told, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. I think that indicates that they now become fellow citizens with believing Jews and are of God's household. And of course, this entity, as I mentioned before in 2.20, it's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Now I want to jump down a little bit to Ephesians chapter 3 verse 6 because the train of thought that begins in Ephesians 2.11 culminates in this wonderful description of what it is like for Jews and Gentiles in the church according to verse, or chapter 3 verse 6. And we're told here to be specific that Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And what I want you to notice here is all, all these, these terms that indicate that Jews and Gentiles are working together here. Now, it's important to understand that he's not saying here that believing Gentiles become Jews. 
He's not saying that they're incorporated into, into Israel. But he does say that believing Gentiles are fellow this and they're fellow that, and then they work together in this church that we are in, in this one new man. Notice that he says that they're fellow heirs, they're fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So that indicates full participation together, which is a wonderful truth. Uh, in Galatians chapter 3, I think that, that's the next one that I'll go to here. In Galatians chapter 3, uh, Paul is going to explicitly state that believing Gentiles in the church are now participating in the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, he's, you know, if you're familiar with the book of Galatians, he's, he's really getting after the false teaching of, of some Judaizers who were teaching that in addition to faith, you had to keep the Mosaic law and be circumcised. And he's arguing you know, for salvation through faith alone. And so he's making that case. And you know, he even points out in Galatians chapter 3, verse 6, that Abraham is the paradigm of salvation through faith. As a matter of fact, there's several references to uh, Genesis chapter 15, where it's the account where Abraham is said to be um, through faith to have righteousness credited to him. But in Galatians chapter 3, verse 6, we're told, even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And that, that's a great statement there, that through faith in God, God being the object, that there's the reckoning of righteousness. That's what you know, we would call imputed righteousness. Uh, Christ's righteousness is given to the one who has believed, and it's through faith alone. So we're told in verse 7 that, therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And so he's, now what he's going to say here in verse 8, he's going to be talking about the Gentiles and how they're related to this. So he says in verse 8, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. This is very interesting here. Because again, we're, we're seeing this is that this prediction that the Gentiles would be blessed and incorporated into the Abrahamic covenant was actually stated explicitly in the Old Testament. This particularly would have reference to Genesis 12.3 and Genesis 22.18, which you know, specifically mentions the nations there. But what's important to understand here is he's telling us in verse 8 that it was predicted that Gentiles would be, have the gospel preached to them and, the, and they would believe. And what's interesting about that is when Paul is talking about Gentiles being a part of the Abrahamic covenant, he doesn't quote Genesis 12 two, which talks about the great nation. Remember, we're, Abraham was told a great nation will come from you. That nation was Israel. What he does, though, is he quotes Genesis 12.3, which was talking about Gentiles to begin with. And I think that's really important because we're seeing the Gentiles included in the Abrahamic covenant, but it's not a statement that believing Gentiles become Israel, because if he wanted to say that, he probably would have quoted Genesis 12 too, where, it's where he was talking about the great nation in reference to Israel. So he says that this was predicted in the Old Testament, and then we're told in verse 9, so then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. So Gentiles become a spiritual descendants of Abraham through faith, and when they partake in the faith in God that Abraham did, there's a sense in which they're a son of Abraham and a descendant of Abraham. As a matter of fact, we're told in Galatians 3.29 that if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendant. You are his seed, heirs according to promise. Something that's very similar to this is found in, uh, in Romans chapter 4. Just wanted to make this point here because when I think of Galatians 3, I think of Romans uh, chapter 4. Um, very similar here in Romans chapter 4, uh, Paul is arguing that salvation is through faith alone. And again, he uses Abraham as the paradigm. He mentions Abraham at the beginning of the chapter, um, where in verse 3, where we're told in Romans 4, 3, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then when you jump down to verse 9, we're actually going to see that the timing of Abraham's faith is very important to how we understand this relationship to Jewish and Gentile believers. Verse 9, is this blessing then, when it comes to righteousness through faith alone, is this, well, he goes on to say, is this blessing on the circumcised, which is a reference to the Jews, or on the uncircumcised also? So does, does what Abraham get, this imputed, credited righteousness, 
through faith alone? Does it just come to the Jews or does it come to the Gentiles? He answers that, for we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? And then he makes a big deal here out of the timing of Abraham's faith. He's going to point out here that Abraham had faith before he was circumcised, and this allows him to be in a unique position. So in verse 10, we're told, how then was it credited while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? He answers here, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. So in other words, Abraham believed before he was circumcised, and he received, verse 11, the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised. Now what follows here is very important here because we're going to see, again, what we would call here unity and diversity. Unity in being related to Abraham, diversity in the sense that Jews are still Jews and Gentiles are still Gentiles. The timing of his faith before circumcision means, or so that, end of verse 11, he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them. So what he's saying is, is because of the timing of his faith, he's in a position to be able to be the father of Gentiles who believe. And if you look at verse 12, and he mentions a second group here, the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, in other words, the Jewish people, but, also, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. So basically what he's saying here is Abraham is the father both of Gentiles who believe and of Jews who believe. So is this unity or diversity? Well, it's both. It's unity in the sense that if you're a believing Gentile and then there's a believing Jew, you both have Abraham as your father. But it's not the case that a Gentile becomes a Jew or a Jew becomes a Gentile. Um, that diversity is still there. Um, so this indicates both, both concepts there. So that's very important to understand is that I, I do believe that there is a real sense in which Gentiles and members of the church, and of course this would go for both believing Jews and Gentiles, that they are participating in, in, in some of the key promises of the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant. And I think mostly what we're seeing in this age are the promises that were spiritual in nature. I'm not talking about physical promises spiritualized, but promises that were spiritual in nature, such as salvation, a new heart, the indwelling Holy Spirit, those things are being participated in by believing Jews and Gentiles in this age. And I think that's a, that's a literal fulfillment. But I also believe when you look at the full content of the promises of the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant and the Davidic covenant, that there are still many uh, physical and national promises that still need to take place. And I think that those will uh, be fulfilled at the second coming. Because that's one thing that we should expect. If, if, if there's two comings of Jesus the Messiah, it makes sense to understand that there would be some things that he literally fulfilled at his first coming and then other things that he will literally fulfill at his second coming. I think one of the things that we're seeing fulfilled in this age is that messianic salvation from the son of David is going to believing Jews and Gentiles. I think when it comes to the restoration of planet Earth and the salvation of all Israel and a lot of the physical promises... Those will be fulfilled at the time of the second coming, but the church is definitely participating in the covenants and promises today. When it comes to what the church is to do, and again, a lot of this I think is going to go back to the Great Commission. Uh, it's also going to go back to what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse, verses 7 and 8. That's a passage we've already looked at a couple times, so I won't go through it again. But remember, they're, they're expecting you know, the restoration of the kingdom of Israel in, in, in Acts 1, 6. And then Jesus tells them, you know, that's not for you to know when the Father is going to restore the kingdom to Israel, but I want you to focus on gospel proclamation to the ends of the earth. That's obviously very consistent with the Great Commission at the end of Matthew chapter 28. So I think it is the, the church's mission to share the gospel. Uh, in Matthew chapter 13, uh, which I think is a passage describing the conditions between Jesus' first and second coming, that message of the gospel is also linked with being the message of the kingdom. It's, it's the message that if a person believes, qualifies them to be a son of the kingdom. And according to Matthew 13, when Jesus comes again, when he actually establishes his kingdom, those who are sons of the kingdom and related to him will actually be able to enter 
that kingdom when he comes again. So the church preaches the gospel. Uh, it's also to remain firm in the truth until Jesus comes again. Uh, I like uh, mentioning 1 Timothy 3.15 because it tells us, Paul's telling us, that the church is the pillar and support of the truth. Uh, as we, we saw today in the sermon today with Romans 11, there's a sense in which Israel, uh, the, uh, the custodian of God's message, has stumbled temporarily. And so um, I, I like the image of a, uh, of a baton. There's a sense in which the, the message of the gospel and the message of the kingdom has been given to the church in this age. Israel has stumbled, but God's plans and purposes go forth and that message of the gospel and salvation has been given to the church, and we're to take that to the world. It's also true, as I mentioned on the next point here, that Jesus will give the church positions of authority in his kingdom. And there's a couple passages here that I think are really noteworthy. Um, as a matter of fact, that what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to mention one other than what I have here first. But when you come to Revelation... If you studied Revelation, you know that Revelation chapters 2 and 3 are messages to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And Jesus evaluates each church. He tells them where they're doing well, and he tells them where they're not doing so well. And then he gives these promises that, you know, if you endure, you're going to have these, these blessings, which are incredible blessings usually associated uh, with, with, with the kingdom of God. But one of the things about Revelation chapters 2 and 3 is you see that the church is under intense persecution. Uh, they're under persecution from the nations, they're under persecution from unbelieving Jews, and they're definitely a target of Satan. Uh, there's, there's a sense in which they are facing the wrath of the world and Satan as they're doing their mission, and Jesus calls for them to be, to be firm. Uh, what I, the, the first passage I wanted to, to, to quote for you was... Uh, Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 to 10. I understand this isn't Revelation 2 and 3, but I, I, I wanted to use this and then go to Revelation 2, 2 and 3. But there's this heavenly scene according to Revelation 5, starting, it's actually all of Revelation 5, but there's, there's, this, there's a song that's being sung in heaven according to verse 9. In Revelation 5, 9, we're told, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you, and this is in reference to Jesus, to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So that indicates Christ with his death has made atonement, and that is extending not only to Jews, but to, to all people groups. And so that occurred. We saw in, uh, earlier in Acts chapter 3, verse 18, that the, the promises concerning Christ's sufferings, those have been fulfilled. Then we're told in verse 10 this is something that's future. You have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So that's an interesting already not yet scenario. Christ has already purchased with his blood people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And those who have had that happen, they are sons of the kingdom. They're citizens of the kingdom. But we're told that they will reign upon the earth, which is obviously a very clear passage indicating that there's a coming reign of Jesus the Messiah and his saints upon the earth. And I think, you know, from my understanding of theology, that would take place with the second coming, with the millennial kingdom of Revelation chapter 20. Now, if you come back to Revelation chapter 2 and look at verses 26 to 27, this is also important. Uh, in Revelation chapter 2, this is for the church at Thyatira. And by the way, since these passages are very... Uh, grand and um, seem to be very, I guess, what we would call eschatological, very future-oriented, very much blessings associated with the kingdom. We usually take most of the promises to a specific church to probably be applicable to all church believers. But if we're told in verse 26, Jesus says, He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds into the, to the end, to him I will give authority over the nations." And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father. Now, in your Bible, you may note that's either in caps or bold, which would indicate that's an Old Testament quotation. It actually takes you back to Psalm 2, which is a messianic prophecy about the reign of the Messiah. Uh, God, the Father, says, I'm going to establish my son and my king upon Mount Zion, 
and he's going he's to rule with the rod of iron, and that's going to even include you know, over his enemies and those who had, had mocked him. What's interesting about this is Jesus, Jesus has, is going, he presently has the rights of authority over the nations, but we're told that he's going to actually rule them actually when he comes again. But we're told here, and again, Revelation 2 and 3, this is written to the church. Uh, this is written to the church, and I think it's applicable to us, but to those who overcome, what are we told? To him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. You know, there, there's, and again, I'm sure this is not true of this church, but there, there's a lot of Christians that think that the destiny of a person is just like to go sit on a cloud someday, you know, to get the halo on the head, get a harp, and sit on a cloud and, you know, and stare into the sky all day. Uh, the Bible presents the picture that when Jesus comes again, he's going to rule na- literal nations. And we're told here that those who are members of the church are going to participate with him in that reign. And that what we do now influences what we will be doing when Jesus comes again. I don't have time to go there, but if you want to read more of that, read uh, Luke 19, verses 11 through 27, where it talks about a nobleman who goes away to receive a, 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 receive a kingdom from a distant country, and then he comes back to reign again, and he rewards his servants. And those who are most faithful are given even more authority. And so... That's very relevant, and, and that's important to understand that as we, as we proclaim the gospel and as we stand for the truth and all those things that we're supposed to do, that this is related, um, this in, influences um, eternity and influences the kingdom and our role in it. Uh, if you look at uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, uh, there's a similar statement here. In Revelation 3, 21, Jesus says, He who overcomes... I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Think of the father's throne as the throne of deity in heaven. Uh, Psalm 110, 1 predicted that the, that the Messiah would have a session at the right hand of the father at the throne of deity. But, but Jesus says here, I'm going I'm to share my throne. Uh, to the one who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. That's the Davidic throne. That's the throne that he assumes um, at the time of the second coming. Remember Matthew 25, 31, Jesus says when, when he comes again in glory with all his, his angels, then he's going to sit on his glorious throne and judge the nations. So that, that's, that's great truth there. I mean, Jesus is telling us that what we do now matters and that he rewards for uh, faithfulness in what we do now. So I think the church has a mission and structure that is unique to this age. When Jesus comes again, the church will rule with him in his kingdom over the nations. So the church's role in summary would be this, to be the instrument. So when we get down to it, I think, uh, I mean, there's going to be a lot of things that the church does, but in a nutshell, I think the church is the instrument for gospel proclamation and truth to the world in this era between Jesus' two comings. We're the ones who have the truth. We're the ones who are to proclaim it. We have, the, we have the baton of the kingdom and the gospel. And Jesus tells us that when he does come again to reign from Jerusalem, when he sits on the Davidic throne, when he reigns, that we are going to reign with him. And at that particular time, we're vindicated. There's a sense in which the saints are persecuted now by the nations, but there's going to come a time where we're, we're in charge, and we're in charge because of the ultimate king, King Jesus. But there's going to come a time where you're actually going to have a ruling theocracy upon the world, and that will occur when Jesus comes again. So the church is a multi-ethnic group that scatters throughout the world to share the gospel to the world amidst persecution from Satan and the nations. The church's reward will be ruling positions in the millennial kingdom over the earth in line with the verses that we've just looked at. I don't believe it is, it is not, well, let's start over, it is not God's intent for the church to replace or fulfill Israel. The church is God's instrument for kingdom gospel proclamation in this age before Jesus returns. But when Jesus returns, that will include the salvation of all Israel, talked about in Romans eleven twenty six, talked about in Zechariah twelve ten. Israel will be fully restored. Right, what I wanted to do now in the remaining time that we have left, I just want to give you a brief summary of the importance of this issue, of really, in a sense, kind of of the, of the whole conference here. Um, why rejecting replacement theology is, is important, and if pastor's okay, I'm hoping to maybe even save a few messages for, for, for any questions you may have. Um, but anyway, why is rejecting replacement theology so important? 
Uh, and again, as, as I mentioned before, I, I think the best argument against replacement theology is understanding what the Bible has to say about Israel and the church. So I think that's the best thing to do. But, but in looking at why it's important to reject replacement theology, I think we must so that we can affirm, number one, that God keeps his promises and fulfills his promises just as he said. In other words, God's a covenant-keeping God. There are times where he may do more things than he said, but he never does less. And what he said he's going to do, he is going to do. Just like we saw in Romans chapter 15, Paul says Jesus came to confirm the promises given to the fathers and bring light to the Gentiles. That's exactly what the Old Testament promised. This is also the basis for knowing that God will keep the promises he makes with us. If God tells Israel one thing and then does another, how do we know he's not going to do that with us? <laughs> Number two, we reject replacement theology so that we can affirm the continuity of God's word, that the story he begins in the, that begins in the Old Testament is the same story he is fulfilling and will fulfill in the future. It's not like we get to the New Testament and there's a reset button hit. And, oh, yeah. All these things you thought were true from the Old Testament concerning Israel, no, that's not really true. You know, we, have, we have a different playbook. That's not the case. There's, there's continuity in the storyline. Number three, so we affirm that our Bible interpretation approach is consistent. We, we don't have a, what's called a, you know, we're talking about Bible interpretation. We don't have like a, a different hermeneutic when it comes to prophecy or Israel. We don't say, well, we're going to take all the passages about the deity of Christ and salvation, and our sinfulness. We're going to take those literally. But when it comes to statements about Israel or prophecy, you know, we're going to spiritualize them or view them as transcended. This is a call to be consistent with our Bible interpretation approach. And I'm convinced that if we are consistent in our Bible interpretation approach, we will understand there is still theological significance for Israel, and there's importance for the church, and there's no replacement theology. Number four, so we can properly understand God's purposes for Israel and God's purposes for the church and how they tie together. Now, a lot of times when we study the Bible, and this is actually a good thing, I mean, we study it for principles for living and, 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 and how, to, how to do the right thing. But there's also a sense in which God wants us to understand the bigger picture purposes. And let's face it, the more we understand the bigger picture, the more likely we're going to understand what we're supposed to be doing, <laughs> you know, within, within the picture. So we need to understand God's big picture purposes. And then number five, and again, we haven't talked a lot about this. I, uh, um, but there's, there's been some good works that have really documented this. So it says the church can avoid the mistake of fostering anti-Semitism and wrong views towards Israel, which historically has been a problem. Now, I, I do want to give a little caveat to there. I'm not saying that if a, per, a person believes in replacement theology that they're always anti-Semitic. That's not the case. There's some people who believe the Bible teaches replacement theology um, and they're not anti-Semitic, so I totally get that. But, but when you look at things historically, um, when large numbers of Christians and churches and denominations have adopted replacement theology, oftentimes it has helped foster anti-Semitism. That has been true. I understand I wouldn't view Roman Catholicism as a true church, but you look at the history of Roman Catholicism, anti-Semitism has often been linked with the replacement theology. When you look at what was going on, with some of the churches in Germany at the time of World War II and the Holocaust, there was definitely a replacement theology as a basis for some of the things that was taking place at this time. So if one person holds a replacement theology, probably not a big deal. If there's even you know, several Christians that hold that, probably nothing. But when, you, when the church as a whole begins to adopt that, then um, the bigger the problem can be. Okay. All right, Richard, do we have time for any questions. You guys have been held captive for five messages. Now this is your time to, uh, to stump the conference speaker. I'm the runner and I do have an off button, so be nice with your questions. <laughs> Who wants to start? We got a couple over here. We're going to start with Seiko Woods. Seiko, go ahead. Stand up. Appreciate you, Dr. Block, for your time. I just want to have well, two questions, hopefully, you can answer okay. these. Um, those who hold to Amiel theology, they'll, they'll pose the question, how many brides does God have? They'll, we know that Israel is also called God's bride, and also the church is called the bride of Christ. So yeah. how would you respond to 
that question being levied against those of us who hold to. Yeah. Uh, and the New Jerusalem is called a bride. Exactly. Yeah. I do believe the church is the bride of Christ, but I, I, don't, think, I don't think the bride is, a, is an exclusive title that only belongs to one group and not another. So I think there's a sense those who end up being related to Christ, the Messiah by faith, whether Jew or Gentile, or those who are part of the church in this age, can have that used of them just as it's used of Jerusalem, of the new Jerusalem in, in the eternal state. So I guess the key is I'm not seeing it so much as an exclusive title. I, I think it's if you do that, that somebody may be able to charge that. They say, well, you're saying the church is the bride, but it also says Israel is the wife of Jehovah, so are there two. I think that's kind of a, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, um, like I said, for those who are making that argument, it's kind, of, it's kind of a silly argument. But I think the key is the metaphor of the bride is indicating intimacy with our God with whom we have a relationship. And I think that extends to Jews and Gentiles. So I think there's a sense which it's, it, it's not true to say that that concept only applies to the church. It's certainly true of the church, and the church is the bride of Christ, but I wouldn't say that just applies to them. Was there, another, was there a follow-up? You said you had two. Okay. <laughs> um, the second question is... Um, how do you respond to the to the fifth point that you had mentioned about you know you know historically yeah. you know the antisemitism has basically you know come through uh, our mill theology. I, I had the conversation with a couple of brothers that I know that I love and respect that are replacement yeah. uh, theologians. And when I bring up the the statements by Martin Luther that yeah. most of us who are Calvinists or those of us who love Reformed theology, yeah. you know they they take issue with or make excuses for the things that Luther yeah. said regarding the Jews. How would you respond to that? Well, are, are they saying it's not really a problem? They're saying it's not really a problem and that basically he may yeah. have had made some statements, but he yeah. was not anti-Semitic or his statements yeah. were not anti-Semitic. And I would say no. you can't downplay the significance of Luther's anti-Semitic statements later on because it en they ended up being used by groups hostile towards Israel and involved in the Holocaust that was used as theological support for the atrocities that were taking place. So obviously because Luther is so significant historically, there's a sense, and even when he, make, when he makes those sign of statements, that the implications are great. Now, I do want to add, though, that when you, when you get to the, uh, the Puritans, who are very much in the Reformed tradition, they, are very, they, they, they say a lot of great things about the Jews and the future of Israel. So that's not a problem all the way across the board. But I, I know what you're saying. All right. And uh, when you ask a question, just give us your name first. I, I, I know David Andrews, but I don't <laughs> want to embarrass myself later. So I'm going to let each person introduce himself. Go ahead and straight up. Um, I had a question from uh, this morning uh, when you were talking about all Israel will be saved and whatnot. Um, am I to understand that to mean that the nation of Israel that exists at a certain time will turn to God and those particular people? That's not a all, all Jews for it's all It's not all the remnant. Yeah, it, I, I actually did this. I actually went through all the references to all Israel in the Bible, and there's a lot of them. It usually seems to be those that are living at the time of the, of, of, of the event that's taking place. Like Moses spoke to all Israel. That doesn't mean that he spoke to every generation that ever existed. And so, and he already it included the remnant earlier. So I think when he talks about all Israel, um, it, it, that, that's a great question. Just to define it, I would hold all Israel as, as the nation as a whole, not necessarily every single individual. And it, it's kind of the reverse of Christ first coming. Like we would say Israel did not believe at Jesus' first coming. But we know the apostles did. And we know that there, was, you know, there were several who believed. So there was the remnant who believed, but it wasn't all Israel. I think it's going to be the flip at the second coming. I think it's going to be the majority of the Jews with their leaders, but it's not going to be every single individual. Can I, have a, can I do one more? Okay. <laughs> and maybe this is, um, I don't know, maybe there's a 30-second answer to this, because I know this could probably be another conference. But the, there were a lot of smart people who don't believe the way that you believe, and yeah. they must have some proof text Definitely. or something. So <laughs> is there like a 30-second version of what their, what their thought process is uh, at, at, to, to uphold their position? The 30-second version, I think, would be, I think, I think that in general, because there's a, there's a lot of different people that have nuanced views, but I think in general there's the belief that the Old, that the old Testament is primarily shadows and types that give way to greater things in the New Testament and the greater things mean the transcending of physical and national promises. I think that's really where the issue, I, th I think it's a presupposition that national and physical things aren't really spiritual, and what's more spiritual is a multi-ethnic entity that has na national implications 
talk about physical kingdom gives way to a spiritual kingdom. I think, there, I think that's the assumption. And I would assume that your response to that would be that that's kind of overlaying a philosophy on the actual. Yeah, I've done, I've done some work on this. Uh, it, it, this would lead more to the, uh, the three-day answer than the 30-second answer. Yeah, yeah. But, but, the, but, the, but the, the, not the, when, you, when you get into the, uh, the second century of the church, there's a lot of Greek philosophy influence that starts to take a lot of the Christian theologians on a more spiritual trajectory away from literal kingdom and, literal prom- and promises to Israel being fulfilled. When you, look at the, when you look at the Old Testament, the promises are very holistic. They, they include spiritual salvation and spiritual dynamics, but they're often coupled with physical and national and international blessings. So I think there's an assumption on the whole that physical and national things somehow aren't spiritual and they get transcended. There's kind of a reset button when you get to the New Testament. Bill. I'm Bill Tan. I just have a quick question. I think this is a good segue for the previous, from the previous question, and that is the promise uh, that was mentioned in Hebrews 11 concerning the promise of the land to Abraham. Mm-hmm. And it, it appears to me that it says that Abraham didn't really believe in that physical land promise, but he was looking forward to that dwelling place and uh, the foundations of the city whose architect and builder is God. Mm-hmm. So how do you then explain the literality I, of the promise yeah. and the explanation in the book of Hebrews. I don't think in verse 16 that heavenly means non, non-physical. I think it's indicating source. So I, I still think that, he's, that, that it is still a, it, it's a, it's a physical city because later, I, I, think, I think it's in Hebrews 13, that it refers to, um, in, in, Hebrew, in Hebrews 13, 14, it refers to a city which is to come. So... I actually think that he is, he is looking for a, a physical city. It's a city that's still to come. And when you see the word heavenly, it's not anti-physical, but it means it sources heaven. It's kind of like the kingdom of heaven. Uh, in, in Scripture, the kingdom of heaven doesn't mean heaven is the kingdom, but it's the kingdom that comes from heaven. And just like with our spiritual bodies in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about that we're going to have a spiritual body in 1 Corinthians 15. He doesn't mean that it's a Casper the ghost body but he means it's, it's, it's a physical glorified body that, that sources heaven. So I think the key there is understanding is heavenly is not anti-material, but it's source. Hello, my name is uh, Lawrence Hinson, and uh, I appreciate how you've narrowed the view and given us an overview of scripture, kind of an integrated perspective, and it's been very helpful. Uh, I'm going to ask a how question on application. Okay. Every one of us are watching the news, the Hezbollah, the Hamas, the Palestinian, and we know there are movements which represent both views that you hold, like the Bethlehem Conference uh, that was held uh, just a little over a year ago, which was representing uh, sort of this replacement theory. Are you talking about Christ at the checkpoint? Yes. Their conference. Okay. So what? And my, my question really has to do: How can we apply these insights and concepts to interpret contemporary events that are going on? You did it historically in your book, and you mentioned a little bit of that here about the Puritans and about Luther. Right. What about today, and where are we headed, and how do you see this unraveling as we go toward? Uh, whatever, Armageddon or anything you want to say about that. Thank you very much. Yeah. So you're basically just talking about our view towards the Jewish people in, in, in Israel today? Because it's obviously a broad question, because there's obviously implication. I mean, cause a lot of times that question is associated also with, how, you know, how, how should national Israel be viewed from the perspective of other countries in the United States? Well, there are political implications for what you're saying, basically. Yeah. And yeah. I guess my, my question is, we... We hear on television certain commentators yeah. uh, espousing what's going on. How would this view uh, of supporting Israel impact yeah. us to interpret contemporary yeah. news that all we right. hear every day of the week? Yeah. Well, first of all, I would say that we should be like Paul, who at the very end of Acts, even after the church has been around for a while, he's concerned for the salvation of Israel. And he's concerned with that. So in other words, I would say as a church, I mean, our main responsibility is prayer and gospel presentation. So we, we need to reject two covenant theology, which would hold that, hey, we have Jesus as the Messiah for Gentiles and part of the church, but 
but Israel doesn't need to believe in Jesus, the Messiah. I know you didn't, you didn't bring that up, and I'm not, I'm not saying that's what you hold, but we definitely believe that Israel needs to believe the gospel. We're also told in Romans 11 that there's a remnant, according to grace, who are coming to faith. So our, our main responsibility is in gospel presentation. I mean, I think there's also a sense, too, where when we look at God's prophetic plan um, uh, regarding Israel, I, I think to look at the reestablishment of Israel as a nation, say there's no significance to that whatsoever. I mean, I think that's a little bit naive because the scripture does seem to indicate that there is going to be a regathering so that in Daniel 9, Israel can sign a, a covenant with the, uh, the evil prince who, who is to come. Um, and so there, there's various things that may be theologically significant. I'm not a big fan of, of saying things are for sure fulfillments, and we're certainly not into date setting. But I think to be aware of the times and understand that it's pretty incredible that for a nation to pretty much stop existing for 2,000 years to come back in existence... Um, is, is relevant, so we need to be awake on that. But I guess the short answer would be is, uh, is prayer and, and gospel presentation. And just to be clear, I mean, when, and I understand the nature of the questions, but when, when we say these are your views, I just want to be clear, Dr. Vlock's views are my views and the views of this church historically, just so everyone's clear on that. So it's, it's not just his view. And we're taking live Twitter messages as this goes on, and someone is reminding me that it's the blood moon tonight, just so... Everyone. <laughs> and Supermoon. <laughs> Someone else? From our liberal wing or our conservative wing? <laughs> yeah, thanks for the uh, Blood Moon update, Dr. Hagee. <laughs> um, how does the uh, how does the rejection of replacement th theology? affect covenant theology? In other words, the fact that they hold a replacement theology, how does it end up, how does it end up? Yeah, how does the refutation of replacement theology affect the, 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 the primary tenets of covenant theology? Okay. I just want to make sure, in other words, the, are you talking about how does their view of replacement theology, or you, when you say the rejection of replacement, like from our standpoint, like if we reject, because repl most within covenant theology would hold us some form of replacement theology. Correct. So in other words, how, how, how does it affect how we view them or how, does, how do their views? Yeah, how, how does, a, how does, re how does um, refuting replacement theology undermine okay, from the our basis standpoint. of covenant theology from our standpoint? Well, I would, I mean, it, it ends up being the case that m most, of our, most of our covenant theologians believe that the church has replaced Israel, and then for some of them, they would actually believe that there's a sense that if the church is the new Israel, that the church has somehow inherited Israel's role, and for some, particularly those who would be post-millennial, believe that the church actually should be involved in, you know, social transformation, uh, in other words, for the, and so the world can be Christianized before Jesus comes again, so I, th I think for those who hold that particular view, usually within covenant theology, there's a lot more already kingdom than perhaps what I've been presenting here. And the more you would have already, you would already have Jesus reigning from David's throne. There would be a lot more implications in, re in regard to the kingdom that that's taking place today. So I think it can impact the church's role and how they view themselves. If the church truly views themselves as the replacement of Israel, um, that perhaps could lead to a... Uh, a wrong understanding of the church's mission. My understanding of the church's mission is gospel proclamation to the end of the earth, not transformation of society. And I think you see more of that within covenant theology, although there can be some distinctions between amillennialist and postmillennialist in that regard. Someone else? Back here. Richard's having pity on my old age. He's coming my way. Appreciate that. Um, you mentioned some of the anti-Semitism that takes place to those mm -hmm. who um, reject this view. Um, how would you address some of the anti-Arab like Arab Semitism, that, I mean, Arab um, notions that come from a lot of dispensational views, um, who tend to, I mean, like Voice of the Martyrs recently, I think last year, put Israel on a nation that's hostile towards the church. Um, and there's been a lot of persecution of Christian Arabs within, I believe, in Gaza. How would you say we who hold this view um, address that? Address the issue of, of like, views towards, like, um, Arabs and Christ Christians? 
Yeah, and kind of like yeah. the stand, the stand with Israel, you know, movement yeah. that stands with them no matter what. Yeah. Well, I think the church's view, I mean, like, like you said, I, I, I think it's possible to have a right view of Israel's future and have a wrong application. Like, I don't think believing in the things that we've talked about means that we must approve of everything that Israel does. I mean, if, if there are, you know, things that aren't done right, those things need to be addressed. I mean, obviously, I think there's been a lot of things done to Israel that aren't right, and those, those need to be addressed as well. But I guess I would just affirm wherever something done is wrong, even if it's evangelicals, I'm just speaking very generically here, evangelicals towards, 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 the, towards you know, uh, Arabs or Palestinians or whether, I, I mean, those things, need to, those things need to be called out. And, I, I, and also I would want to affirm too that um, belief in a future for Israel doesn't mean that we think that the current state of Israel is okay. I mean, I have more affinity with a with a, you know, a, a Palestinian brother, somebody who's not Jewish, who lives in that area, who's a believer in Christ, than a non-Jewish believer. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we need to show love towards them and, 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 and do what's right in that regard. A couple more. Someone else? Back over here. I'm closer. I'm going to start here and I'll come to you. Oh, you didn't have a question. Adjusting your glasses. All right. <laughs> My fault. And give us your name, please. Uh, I'm Cameron Malott. Um, I guess I was wanted to ask you to clarify um, the significance of being a Jew that does not believe. Um, so, for example, I guess before the coming of Christ, being a part of the nation of Israel, would you say that a Jew that did not believe will be in heaven? No, it would be lost. It would be lost. Yeah. So I, um, I think there's a corporate election of Israel as a nation, but there's also individual election. Okay. And a person has to believe in God through faith in order to be saved. That's okay. what kind of like, I think that Romans 4 passage where when Paul talks about that Abraham is the father of the circumcised who also follow Abraham in their belief... <laughs> That, that's what it takes. Okay. So, so in other words, there are Jews who you know, are not rightly related to God and, and, and die that way and be separated. Okay, so I guess I'm a little bit unsure. So is, I guess, is there any significance of one being, a, what would be the significance of one being a Jew, I guess, previous to the resurrection um, and yet not believing? I guess, would you just say that they were I guess they benefit in being part of God's covenant people, but eternally will not. Yeah, I mean, there ends up being be, some, tor- in other words, there ends up being as God's blessings will, co- will come up. Because obviously there's various times in Israel's history, particularly under Solomon, where things are going great. There's other times where things are really bad. And, and there's people that can receive temporal blessings as God's blessing the nation. And they may receive temporal, bl- by that I'm talking about, you know, you know physical blessings and peace and prosperity of crops and all that sort of thing without, without being saved. But, if, they're, but if, they don't, if they don't do what Abraham did to believe in God and have it you know, credit them as righteousness, they would, you know, they'd be lost when they die. Good question. There's one way over there. I don't know if there's anybody else. But... Would you say that um, covenant theology is more rooted in Christian orthodoxy? Is rooted in Christian orthodoxy? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think they hold to the, I mean, covenant theologians hold to the, uh, you know, the, the basics of the gospel, you know, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. So when it, when it comes to the gospel, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of good things going on in covenant theology. And so, you know, when it, when it comes to the issue of gospel, doctrines of grace, understanding of scripture, those sorts of things. I mean, like I said, I think there's some errors when it comes to the issue of, uh, you know, understanding the people of God and Israel's relationship to that. But there, I mean, there's a lot of dear brothers in Christ who affirm covenant theology. Well, I just, the most common I, response I get is that, you know, since they're, they don't want to err in doctrine, so they want to be formally rooted in replacement theology because it's uh, orthodoxy. So is there a response to that? that we... In other words, they feel like they're affirming orthodoxy by holding, right. the view, holding the view that they do. Right. You can yeah. clarify if you Yeah, and, and I would say, the, I mean, the early church ends up being a mixture. I mean, you, you end up having a lot who are affirming salvation and restoration of Israel and others who are denying that. So, I mean, when it comes to the early church, you know, it's always, it seems to be a mixed bag. 
on almost everything. There's no doubt that it really becomes dominant, I mean, when, once you get into the, into the third century. But I think the reasons it's becoming dominant aren't good because it's also connected with the rise of uh, allegorical interpretation and spiritualization of Scripture and, and, and some anti-Semitic thoughts that are taking place in the church. Of course, the main thing is being rooted in what the Scripture says. Hello, uh, my name is Ramsey Robbie. Um, you had mentioned that uh, when the saints are glorified, that we're going to be real, ruling over individuals who aren't glorified. They'll be mm -hmm. nations. They'll be Israel. Yeah. And a lot of the future prophecies that concern the future of Israel, they have language that talk about the reaper is going to overtake the sower. Um, mm -hmm. They're going to have, you know, the one who lives to be a hundred years. If he dies at a hundred years, he's going to be thought curse. to be, right. You know, young, too young to die. Um, a lot of these seem to be mortal promises yeah. um, that concern people who aren't glorified, people who aren't at a place where they'll live forever. Right. Wouldn't it be possible to believe that those prophecies apply to the, the Israelites that are not glorified and still hold that the church is basically Gentiles who've been incorporated into national Israel? Yeah, you, it went a little bit different turn than I thought it was going to originally <laughs> go at first. So I'm trying, I'm trying to get. So what would what would the the narrow question be? Is uh, wouldn't it be possible to hold that those future promises concerning national Israel will be fulfilled okay. in those Israelites who haven't been glorified yet? They came to yeah. faith when Christ. Right. Christ so just returned. to stop there, I mean, I definitely think that there's there's going to be you know uh, non glorified Israelites and Gentiles as part of the millennial kingdom. So yes. So wouldn't it be possible to still hold to that and still also hold to the church being Gentiles incorporated into that nation? But I guess why, why would that be? The, I, my question would be why would, I mean, if the scripture doesn't make that step, why would we, well, why would we assume that? It seems, I, I think it does. But, yeah. See, I, I would just but say. But I'm saying yeah. what, what would be the reason why that couldn't be? Because the scripture doesn't teach it and it's not, the, it's not God's purpose for for, to, for Israel to have Gentiles incorporated into Israel. Israel's role is to bring blessings to the Gentiles as Gentiles, not make everybody Israel. Okay. And even after Christ comes, like that, that Romans 15 passage we looked at, he, Christ comes to confirm the promises made to the fathers and to bring salvation to the Gentiles. So even after the cross, there's all these statements of he's doing this for the Jews and he's doing this for the Gentiles. I don't see any statements... Anywhere before or after the cross where, okay, it's, it, it's God's purpose now for, for Gentiles to become spiritual Jews. I just don't, I don't see that. Thank you. Let me just say a word at this point, Dr. Vaughn, um, and I know, I assume that you, you feel the same way. You know, if, if you have held to a position different than what you've heard at the conference this weekend, uh, but you love Christ and you love the Word of God, we love you. I mean, you're our brethren. And so what we want to encourage through a conference like this is what I mentioned, I think, the first night, and that is let's be Bereans. You know, let, let's, let's go to the Word of God and let the Word of God speak and hear what it says and receive it. And um, I can still remember the first time that I came face to face with the doctrines of grace, you know, commonly known as Calvinism, and argued up and down that there was no way for God so loved the world, right? I mean, that was, that was my point. So, um, you know, we're all growing, we're all learning, and I think this church is a great example of how we can love each other because we have brothers and sisters here who don't hold to the view that you've heard this weekend, the view that I hold to, the view that we preach here. Um, but what we want to incur, what we can't say is these things don't matter. That's what we can't say. So to the word of God we go. And we open the scriptures together and we study these things. Um, so I hope, I hope that's helpful for anyone here who, who has not yet embraced these things. Um, come on over, you know, is my heart's <laughs> desire. I say that lightheartedly. Uh, let's take one more and we'll be done, done for the weekend. Someone else? 
Seiko, because you've asked, well, let me see if there's anyone else first. Now, I'll come back to you if not. Yes, Brother James. I don't need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you one anyway. Just hold on. Hold your horses. And I know you would give us your name anyway. I'm James, I'm James Michelson. Thank you for coming, brother. And I think, I hesitate because I think you have already earlier answered this with two earlier questions. I'm, I'm going to have to, if I ever have time, explore the idea that when Jesus returns, there's, where I'm stuck, this, I think you already answered this. Well, I'm, I'm, it's hard to express myself. I'm thinking, and I don't think anybody here, no matter what a person's view is, and I think you've already addressed this, the, the urgency, whether we are witnessing to somebody who is ethnically Jewish or they're a member of ISIS or they're Arab or they're Jehovah Witness or whoever they are, the burning urgency, you need to believe in Jesus today. And you've already said that. And so mm -hmm. I think that, that I'm thinking of the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. And the, the, the foolish virgins, the door was shut. And you can almost hear it when Christ is telling the story. And that there's a time when the door is shut. And I may be good men draw that line at different ways and make those lines very complex. Where I, when Jesus comes back, this is just my simple understanding, the door is shut. And the time to believe in Jesus is now. And I think, but you already said that, so um, maybe I'll pass the, <laughs> I, that I would, what I would be concerned about, you say, James, what's your point? My point is that, if there is a view, and I, it's a horrible thing to misrepresent and ungodly to misrepresent anything that another brother says, is bearing false witness. But if somebody would step away, no matter what your background, no matter what your view, and say, well, you know, the urgency, because the Jews, after Jesus comes back, yeah, they're going to be all fixed up anyway. And I, we, why bother witnessing to them? And that's my heart. That's my heart. It's just that. Yeah, I would agree. That we, I mean, Paul says he wishes he could be accursed on behalf of those who had not believed, which is should be our heart as well. And so we should never take an attitude. We know there's going to be an all Israel who will be saved. And by the way, the all Israel is going to still have to believe. And according to Ezekiel 20, even when Jesus comes, there's a purging under the rod, and there are some who are judged for not believing. And so I guess I would just affirm that we need to have a, a full throttle gospel message to the world for, for Jews and non-Jews and, you know, the, uh, the pedal to the metal until Christ comes again. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Vlock. We appreciate it very much. All right. Can I say just one more? Are we done? Can I say one more thing? Again, I just wanted to thank you for your, for coming and for your generosity and the fellowship. This has been a outstanding three days, and I've been very honored to be here. Uh, love this church, love the people, look forward to praying for you and keeping in touch with Pastor Richard to see how things are going, and again, just thank you. Amen. All right. Well, we are blessed, aren't we, church? And so grateful for Dr. Vaughn and him being with us this weekend. So grateful also for those who've I know there are many who've, who um, have made a long drive to be here with us for each one of these sessions, and we appreciate you and thank God for you. And uh, as Butch uh, did earlier, I want us to, to close the conference by praying for our brother and friend and teacher for the weekend and, and ask God's blessing upon him and his family and his work. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this weekend, for the things that we have seen from your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would um, approach your word uh, in a way that trembles before it. Uh, we have uh, no right uh, to twist your words out of their place, uh, to lay a grid on top of what you have said, uh, even if it's um, one that finds um, 
friends throughout history, God, we, we must take your word in, in the way that you intended it. And I pray that we would strive as a people uh, to come to your word humbly, that we would be humble enough uh, to turn from any position that we have held to that cannot be soundly, rightly, accurately supported from the scriptures. Lord, I pray that we would joyfully jettison such things and embrace the truth as we see it in Scripture. We thank you so much for uh, Dr. Vlock, uh, Dr. Vlock's uh, work this weekend, for his heart, and we do pray your blessing upon his work there at the seminary. Pray for your blessing upon him, upon his family. We ask, Lord, for your blessing upon his work in the local church where he serves, and uh, Lord, take him home safely is our prayer. And take each one of us home this evening safely. And Lord, as we've been reminded uh, this weekend and even tonight, uh, let us look around at this world full of people who need Jesus and be faithful with the gospel that you've entrusted to us. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. You're dismissed.